Today's episode is sponsored in part by Palo Alto Networks and its Prisma Sassy, where AI-powered innovation takes center stage. Watch the new Palo Alto Networks virtual event on demand to hear how the latest innovations in Sassy can help your organization. See how ZTNA 2.0, Cloud Secure Web Gateway, and SD-WAN deliver exceptional security and ROI. Watch on demand at paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. Welcome to Heavy Networking, the flagship podcast from the Packet Pushers. Find out more about us at PacketPushers.net and follow us on LinkedIn. I am Ethan Banks, your co-host. Since 2010, when which Layer 2 Ethernet fabric would reign supreme was, was uppermost on our minds. Drew Conroy Murray joins me as co-host today, and, and oh my, how times have changed since we were arguing about trill and shortest path bridging. Today, our networks are so complicated that what we used to call the network is now just the underlay. And on top of that underlay, we run all sorts of encapsulations. And it's inside that overlay where all the interesting stuff is happening. Yeah, I, I know not everybody's doing an overlay, but between Lisp and CapWap and MPLS and VXLAN, how many of the packets you care about aren't tagged or tunneled or both? It's inside of that complexity you'll find the problem for modern network architects and engineers, because for years we have gotten away with Cowboy engineering, right? Make it work. Whatever it takes, just get it done. We thought of ourselves as as heroes, honestly, solving the problems no one else could figure out how to solve, keeping the system running, saving the budget with an ugly hack. It's not stupid if it works, right? No, not right. Decades of cowboy heroism means that none of us inheriting each other's networks as we move from company to company know what we're walking into. Every network's a snowflake, not because it needs to be as much as different cowboys put their unique stamp on it. It's time network engineering grows up. We need a standard way of building networks. We will never, never successfully automate our networks until we have a standard approach. Our guest today is Scott Rabon, co-founder of the Network Automation Forum. And while Scott doesn't have all the answers to the problems I've raised here, and as he added to my intro, who does? <laughs> well, he has done some hard thinking about a framework that might help us all make some progress. And Scott calls his framework Total Network Operations. Scott, welcome to Heavy Networking. Before we get into Total Network Operations, man, uh, you, you are the co-organizer, co-founder of the Network Automation Forum Autocon Zero event. So, why don't you catch us up on Autocon for 2024? What events are planned? Great to be here with both of you. And uh, why, of course, I'd love to talk about NAF. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of good stuff brewing right now. Um, depending on when this airs, there'll probably be a lot more detail um, out there. But what's in the works right now as a recording, we are in the throes of planning our next event, Autocon 1 in Amsterdam. That uh, Those details should come out within before the end of February. We are also planning on the next U.S. event, Autocon 2. That'll be in November, likely in the Denver area again. We are looking at uh, tr offering training at both of the events, and we're mm -hmm. having some really interesting conversations with the slate of training items that we can pull together for the Amsterdam event. Um, the enthusiasm is high, and the content, I think, is just going to be great. We're also considering a slate of projects that we can do outside of the events in between the events and supporting the community for network automation in general. We're looking at things like smaller local meetups, other things we're prioritizing in terms of what kind of framework documents we think the community wants to put effort into and so forth. So no lack of activity uh, for Chris Grunneman and I, it's really about prioritizing things that we think are going to support the network automation community the best. Now, when you say uh, smaller meetups, you're talking about like NAF sponsored automation related meetups? Correct. Really taking off from part of the challenge that John Willis gave at the uh, November, 2023 um, Autocon Zero, where he talked about how the DevOps days took off and how they were intentionally smaller and hyper-local to use my term. I don't think he used that word but a little more self-directed as well. Not every local group would need to look exactly the same. They could pursue content and activities that were most helpful to that local group. Okay, and then let's drill into AutoCon 1 for just a minute. That, you said, Amsterdam, uh, that's going to be at the end of May 2024. And right now, registration is open. Correct. Yes, as of today or late last week, um, super early bird registration is out there right now. Yep. And we've already... Okay. We're already seeing registrations come in. Now, how many are you expecting to show up for this event? So that's always a fun question to answer. <laughs> you know, our uh, 
Let's just say uh, the, everything I'm about to say are educated guesses, uh, perhaps interpreting the word educated a little liberally. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we each set 200 as a goal for Denver last year, and we got over 340. So we were yep. puzzlingly surprised. My gut is I think we're going to see around 300 for Amsterdam. Uh, again, TBD, we'll, we'll know more as, you know, registrations um, start up. And there is a hockey stick effect. Sorry for those of you who are not hockey fans, but that uh, up and to the right, the closer you get to, you know, the actual event date is a real thing. We, we observe that with Denver. Yeah. And I'll just say, if you're, you know, planning out your time away from work, your travel budget, your event budget, I, I would highly recommend Network Automation Forum. Ethan and I had the opportunity to attend the first one in Denver in 2023. And that feeling of excitement, that feeling of community, uh, aside from all of the great talks and content that were there, uh, really just was inspiring, frankly. So if you are interested in automation, if you feel like you're the only person in your organization doing automation, and maybe the only person at all doing automation, this is a great place to come and meet like-minded folks and have those conversations and make those connections that will really make a difference for you. Yeah, it wasn't just people getting together to talk about stuff. It it had a sense of occasion, and we need to get our heads together and solve some problems. So it felt like something is happening here, and we're a part of a thing that's that we're going to change things. Things are going to be different now because of the yeah. number of people who are getting together trying to solve the problem. It's a very different sort of event in that sense. I think we had the same feeling working up to it, right? It's not that uh, Chris and I created anything. We tapped into something that already existed. And it was all around that hunger to really get better grounding in how do we how do we accelerate network automation in my network and in the industry. Well, all right, Scott, thank you for catching us up on the AutoCon events for this year from the Network Automation Forum. And if you're interested in registering for one of those events, networkautomation.forum, you can find it all there. But let's move on to total network operations, Scott, which sounds very diff total network operation sounds very serious. So give us the elevator pitch around this idea. Well, first of all, I'm not in marketing, and you could probably tell that, right? Um, maybe this isn't the best thing to call it, but it made sense to me. And you'll hear me abbreviate that as TNOPS uh, because I want to be cool and I want to have my own catchphrase out in the industry. No, really, it's because I'm lazy. <laughs> TNOPS is really based on two basic ideas. Uh, we really need to encourage a holistic view of network operations across all the tech silos that are involved in it. And we need to have intentional evaluation of new tech and tools for operations. So number one, systems thinking. Number two, take time to look at new tools as they come out. So when you say holistic view of network operations, uh, can you drill into that a little bit more? Are you talking about uh, holistically being data center, campus, WAN, cloud, et cetera, or something else? So something else, and I'll, I'll lay it out this way. I think there are some well-defined buckets of tools and tech that we use in any operations context. And we talk about a lot about automation and there's some roots here in automation that uh, have led me to this. We'll come back to that. But automation, I would say, is one bucket of technologies and tooling. But my automation tools need to work with my observability and visibility tools. Mm -hmm. And they also need to work with whatever I'm doing from an AI context. And maybe there's AI embedded within those other buckets. They also need to work with what am I doing for collaboration? You know, do I use Jira? Do I want things to go to Slack immediately? How do I coordinate all of these things with my optical layer? How do I coordinate all these things with network security? Mm -hmm. So we tend to have subject matter expertise that really, really focuses and really close on each of those silos, including the network infrastructure itself, right? You know, I could be an, an EOS jockey or a Junos jockey or an iOS jockey and so forth. Everything is highly intertwingled to quote the you know, whole earth catalog from a long time ago. And, uh, you know, the, the silos need to have permeable membranes, right? Uh, there's got to be osmosis. There's got to be the ability to see what's happening across those silos. And I'd cap that all off with quite literally, what am I doing here? And how does, it how does it tie to business objectives or mission objectives, especially if you're in a military context? You know, there's got to be tie off of requirements from the tools I pick, the processes I wrap around them to what am I trying to do from a business perspective? 
I love that you hooked in the business perspective because sometimes we forget that we lose the forest for the trees in that it's all about keeping things up and running, but why, what are we doing this for? What kind of service are we trying to deliver? So I guess hooking that in is really important. Yeah. I, I, I probably the unfair example I use is um, who here was involved in uh, establishing a business case for segment routing. That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> it's the latest new tech, right? And I'm not trying to count, pull out any particular vendor here or anything that may or may not have had uh, motivation for the genesis of that new set of protocols. But uh, it's too easy for us to go chase after the shiny object. We we all do it, right? I, I, Ethan, I've spoken with you about it, so I know you did too, Drew. I won't throw you under the bus on this one. Um, but it is something that we we're all drawn to. Yeah, it's an engineering, uh, the, the kind of a personality that is drawn to a, a technology discipline like network engineering does love the new shiny things. And so sometimes we do things because we can, not because we should. And mapping a technology back to a business need is sometimes like, oh, really, do I have to like explain it? I don't want to, I just want to do it because it's cool, which which isn't good enough, honestly. Right. Well, Scott, how far have you gotten in your development of, uh, I guess I have to call it TNOPS now if I'm going to be cool like Scott. So how far have you gotten with TNOPS? So let me answer that with giving you just a little uh, ramp up and how I got here over the past, you know, four or five months. You know, I want to say this started back in November at uh, at the Denver event, but really it's kind of a culmination of a career here. Um, and I'll explain that as I go. But, uh, you know, we've all seen those cowboy attitudes that you call out. And, uh, you know, Ethan, while you said it was time for networking to grow up, um, I prefer to phrase that as let's gain more operational maturity. But I think we're saying the same thing. Um, and perhaps <laughs> yes. you can you can accuse me of being, you know, the politician and me coming out. I, I'm sorry about well, that. Ju just, just to put a little more polish on, on, on that statement, it, it, it's not it, the way you put it goes to another thing that's been kicking around with network engineers for a long time. Can we really call ourselves engineers because a civil engineer or a structural engineer, or other kinds of engineers have very rigid certifications before they're allowed to call themselves such. And yet we can call ourselves network engineers and it's a job title without any formal training of any sort uh, required necessarily. Uh, so I think this is related to that idea as well. Yeah, you're spot on. And, uh, you know, it goes back to the, you know, the speed at which the internet developed and grew up, you know, in in the mid nineties into the late nineties, just as things were taken off like a rocket um, and your mom got an email address and then your grandmother got an email address. And then all of a sudden think people could actually put their credit card into a browser if they were brave enough to do so mm -hmm. um, as commercialization took off, you know, how did we keep up with the growth? We rewarded people who did, right? And if you didn't need any pedigree, didn't didn't matter what kind of piece of paper you had from college or not have one, um, as long as you could do, you you were gainfully employed and building out that infrastructure. And on one hand, that was awesome and powerful and incredible. Um, on the other hand, it leaves us with long-term behaviors that we might want to take a look at, right? Um, cowboy behavior. Now, I'm building a slide deck on this, and I I went and found my favorite uh, John McClane picture from Die Hard. Um, you know, that's kind of the ultimate cowboy, right? I won't quote anything that's not PG from that, but uh, you know, it's it's kind of built in, especially for U.S. listeners. There's a big part of that individuality of being an American that um, is highly connected here. How do we harness that, but also reduce entropy? Right. Pro provide the right swim lanes, guardrails, pick your favorite motion analogy to get the best of both. Right. That's part of what I'm wrestling with here. Let's pause the conversation for a message from sponsor Palo Alto Networks. 2023 is a year when companies are going to need to do more with less. As businesses grapple with economic uncertainty, it's more critical than ever to consolidate fragmented security and networking solutions to reduce operational complexity and costs. Palo Alto Networks has a new virtual event on its Prisma Sassy, where AI-powered innovation takes center stage. You can watch this event on demand and see how ZTNA 2.0, Cloud Secure Web Gateways, and SD-WAN deliver exceptional security and ROI. 
Hear how the latest innovations in SASE can help your organization automate costly and complex IT operations with AI-powered digital experience management, connect and secure branch offices and the hybrid workforce with SD-WAN, ZTNA 2.0, and Cloud Secure Web Gateways, and unlock better ROI through consolidation of point solutions with Prisma SASE. Watch this event on demand at paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. That's paloaltonetworks.com slash engage slash sassy dash signature dash moment. And now back to the podcast. Are you this this TNOPS idea with that ops uh, word in there makes me think about DevOps, which was in some ways a similar attempt to bring some maturity, some practices, some standards to uh, the uh, integration between developers and operations. Are you borrowing uh, from those notions? Is that where you're getting your inspiration or is there somewhere else this is coming from? So, so that plus plus, and it's a great question. So I think one of the things that I've, I and other folks in networking for years have tried to square up is how DevOps applies to networking. And at, at the highest level, there's a lot of it that makes sense and applies. And there are key pieces of it that don't. You know, there's the physical restriction of physical networking equipment and the laws of physics. These ports plug in to these cables here in time and space. Mm -hmm. I don't have a virtual dev environment that I can clone and turn it into um, a test environment and then, then push that into production. That analogy doesn't hold up with uh, network operations. So part of what I'm trying to do is going back to some first principles that maybe you know, let, a, let us take some of the things that fed into DevOps and apply them directly to network engineering and operations without stopping through DevOps, if that makes sense. Without stopping through DevOps, as in um, I, don't, I don't have to fundamentally change everything I'm doing in the way I deliver network services to adopt this framework you're saying. That's correct. And and we can tease that out as we get into some of the, you know, how could I do this a step at a time, right? Yeah. But the the motivation and inspiration from this started most recently with listening to John Willis's keynote um, at Autocon Zero, where he challenged the audience to think outside your disciplines, right? That's kind of what got me moving on the different silos, the, you know, the different tech disciplines within network operations. Um, read outside your field. and like that's good general advice. And I started, I started doing it here. And one of the things that led me to was a, a luminary from the manufacturing world from the thirties into the eighties, a guy by the name of W Edwards Deming. Does that ring a bell for either of you? Uh -huh. Heard the name. Yeah. So Deming, I was an industrial engineer undergrad. And so I learned all about Deming and in the manufacturing context, right. And not in the, not in terms of networking or it or anything, a long time ago when I was an undergrad. We won't call it out any dates here, but you can read LinkedIn and you can figure that out <laughs> if you'd like to. So, and the main thing I took away from my undergraduate education was manufacturing in the U.S. is probably not a great place to place my bets. So I've said, I don't want to be a manufacturing engineer. From there, I kind of got bit by the networking bug and just went off on that track and forgot most of my industrial engineering, you know, systems engineering type background. Willis does a great job of saying, look, everything that Deming was talking about from a manufacturing improvement context fed right into DevOps. And I won't take away any thunder from, you know, Willis and his book on Deming or some of the other books that are out there that tie these um, things together. The Phoenix Project. Are you familiar with that at all? I read that right mm -hmm. after I read Willis's book. Um I thought the idea of a novel about IT operations was goofy. Um, and it actually really grabbed me. Um, I thought it was very well done. I highly recommend it to anybody. The only thing I didn't like about it was that there's a character that's a board member who is essentially Yoda throughout the whole book. And he asks all these veiled questions in very indirect ways. And like, you can, you can read where the guy is going. Why can't we just be more direct about this? Sorry. Um, editorial opinion. Uh, unsolicited there. Uh, <laughs> the Phoenix Project is a great book and it really helped me tie some of these things together. So, you know, with Willis's encouragement to read more, encouraging me to revisit some of the things from 
uh, Deming and what he did going over to Japan to help Japanese manufacturing and manufacturing quality skyrocket really got me thinking about, okay, how does this connect to DevOps? And then, well, how do I apply it more directly to network operations and engineering? Getting around that other cultural issue that we've talked about, I'm not a programmer. If I wanted to be a programmer, I would have got a cop sci degree. Right. And if you shove this at network engineers and say, well, you just need to apply DevOps to networking, um, I think you turn some people off that you don't need to. So this kind of gave me the nudge to say, well, what if I could stitch it together in a more direct way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that there there is, based on conversations I've had with folks, the notion of having to become a programmer is very off-putting. That, that's exactly why they didn't uh, get into computer science or application development or whatever. It's because they they, they have a, an affinity for networking and its intricacies as opposed to writing code. Uh, so not wanting to turn them off, I think, is great if you're going to try to bring them into a broader framework about how to rethink what they're doing. And And just for the record, I do think the ability to pick up some programming skills in the form of network automation is a real opportunity. It's a, it's a good thing. I, I am not in the, I don't want to be a programmer camp personally, mm -hmm. but I'm just thinking about a broader audience and what do we really need to be able to move this forward, you know, for the network engineer. So you've got a framework that you've begun. It's not completed yet. You've figured out an approach to make it uh, approachable by the average network engineer, maybe who doesn't want to be involved in software development or coding. Uh, are you far enough along that you want help with uh, TNOPS at this point? And, and if you do want some help, what does that look like? Yeah, so the short answer to that is yes. Um, something like this can't be based on one person's opinion or experience, right? Um, so to that point, you know, I've I've taken this initial, hey, I've got some ideas and I've run them by eight, nine, ten trusted advisors in the industry. I could drop names, you would you would know several of them. Um, but the feedback has been really useful so far. Um, I want to amp that up and uh, start getting more formalized about it. I, I I'm gonna put together a survey as that next cut to get um more scale in what people could provide on this. I want to I want to strike that balance between getting the initial survey perfect versus it taking forever, you know, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And uh, if you know me, I will let the perfect really be the enemy of the good. I, there's, I, I need to let go of things much more quickly. So uh, I hope to have that up in the next couple of weeks. And again, by airtime here, I'll be able to publish that. If you can put it in the show notes, that'll be great. So are you looking to, at some point, roll out some kind of TNOPS manifesto? Is that what we should be expecting, some kind of document that captures these thoughts and ideas and lays out a framework? So manifesto <laughs> has been used quite I liberally. I use that word knowing yeah. what I'm getting into. <laughs> um, I, in the, I'm not settled on this, but I've kind of put it as, what if I could create or, or in, help, help a community create what I call a TNOPS field guide? You know, what does it look like? And and one of the questions I need to answer, you know, or I need to answer with lots of um, wise input is how much do I adapt DevOps to network operations or go around it? So I think there's a lot of overlap. I don't know if it's 35%, if it's 70%. You know, how, how much do I want to reinvent the wheel here is a question mm -hmm. that's still open to me. Mm -hmm. And and to facilitate input beyond a survey, you know, I'm thinking about what what does community collaboration look like here? You know, I think Slack is a great tool, um, you know, of choice. A lot of people will say, but Discord. So, you know, I'm thinking through those things, you know, working with Chris on, you know, do we make this inclusive or adjacent to NAF? How we handle those things. So um, lots of thought on this. The, 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 uh, the center of the cookie is still very soft and chewy. Not baked yet. Okay. All right. Uh, as you consider the target audience as you're developing TNOPS, is it in your mind strictly for network operators as implied by total network operations? Or would it be useful for people that are uh, higher up the networking stack, like at the architecture or engineering level? Yeah, definitely the latter. It's ab absolutely for more than just network operators. In fact, that's kind of the idea, right? On one hand, you know, we're talking about Spanning boundaries, right? Again, tying this to business case, 
tying it to the CFO's office, but also keeping in mind you, you need to you need to keep usability and maintainability in mind when designing a network. So your folks who are at the architecture level or the engineering level, I think could benefit from having a greater awareness of how how is this going to help ops? How is this going to create more resilient network infrastructure? And it's beyond um you know, what will a routing protocol do for me or some other, you know, hot standby mechanism, um, you know, or, or, you know, dual hot pairs of services and so forth. Um, that's got to, that, that awareness does need to go up the stack, so to speak. But there's also, you know, the idea of uh, operations taking care of themselves, right? Putting aside time to think about how it all connects together and, taking deliberate time to look at what new tooling and what new technologies are coming out, controlling our own fate to a certain extent without, without expecting that all the, the, uh, the great fluffy awareness of people further, uh, further ahead in the design chain uh, embrace this right away. So, okay. So you've explained total network operations as a, a holistic view of the network and its operations, uh, providing a semi-permeable membrane uh, among silos, which I, I love that image, um, and an intentional evaluation of new technologies, new tools. So what are what what problems are you hoping to address? What what comes out of this? What what happens? What changes? Well, so I can I can tell you the 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 fluffy reasons, right? Better network resiliency, um, lower cost of attaining that resiliency, um, but also a better operating environment for operations teams and individuals on those operations teams, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, talking about this with someone recently, I said, when's the last time you met a really well-rested ops person? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's, there's more to it than just implementing a new operations framework. You know, there's, you know, leadership responsibility. Uh, people who lead teams need to really have that as a goal. Right. How do we make this more livable for the people on the team? Um, I think, Ethan, you and I had this conversation a while back. It, it comes down to people, doesn't it? Um, I think I'm quoting you on that. And uh, that matters. But uh, at a high level, Drew, that's exactly, I think, what we could get out of this. Um, and there's a conversation here that I think we'll get into at some point where what can I start incrementally versus what do I really need to keep in mind for end goals? Um, and that's always a, a tricky balance. Well then, fl flesh this out a little bit. I want to start getting into the specifics of the of the framework, uh, and and you just hit on some of them. But uh, how would adopting TNOPS help network operations teams? Because it's more than just yes, it's people at the guts of it. And I was thinking, you say, have you ever met a well rested ops person? It's like that's an oxymoron. That's not a that's right. not a thing. You know, I spent exactly. lots of years in operations carrying the beeper, uh, the. Or the or the Nokia phone, or the or my own phone, the on call phone, and the beeper, and the laptop is as the case may have been at the time as we were transitioning with stuff. Well rested wasn't like <laughs> I remember getting called at two in the morning by my boss, and I was so out of it as he calls me. I said, "Why are you talking to me right now?" <laughs> that was my response. All I could come up with is I was so out out of it until the, the cobweb shook, and it's like, okay, we have a network down situation. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Let's go. Let's go. Sorry. <laughs> Well, those issues aside, that kind of you know drama and the real life of network operations, uh, aside from a human perspective, how, how does adopting uh, TNOPs help uh, help teams? Well, if we go back to cowboy behavior, if you just let Joe or Josephine or Jay keep being the person who knocks the problems down without any real intentional behavior of, okay, how do we capture what was done? from problem identification through troubleshooting through resolution and then documentation, you know, you're going to be stuck in that mode. You're not going to make any progress if you're just relying on those rock stars. And remember, rock stars aren't always that great, right? They destroy hotel rooms and uh, generate large bills. So, so there isn't always a benefit to being a rock star. Although we all like the, uh, you know, I sure Pete Townsend, if if you want to put me in the role of being a rock star in some of my jobs, my version of break, breaking up the hotel room would be like slamming doors when people said things that just really pissed me off and getting hauled into HR on numerous occasions because I 
was not acting gracefully, Scott. You could put it that way. Yeah. You're not alone. You're not alone. Others have done it too, myself included, right? Um, my, that usually turns into my, I'm sorry you feel that way, which my wife has yeah. informed me that that's not really an it, apology. It doesn't count as an apology. <laughs> yes. No, I understand that now. 25 years ago, <laughs> not so much. So. I'm sorry you're carrying so many personal flaws. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but this this whole idea says let's capture that behavior and routinize it. I love that word. I don't know if it's really a word. Spell check doesn't catch it, so it's probably not official. But uh, how do I how do I avoid having to depend on the superstar, having to be the person that fixes it the next time and the next time and the next time? Mm -hmm. um, capture it in the process. You know, make sure it's tied to real requirements. Right to go back to you know, previous parts of the conversation. Um, but process then becomes workflow and workflow ultimately drives habits on a team. And I think there's a real progression there that we don't probably put a lot of deliberate thought into. So that's a real benefit that I see here, just capturing what works and making it available to others on the team. So I don't become exclusively dependent on those one or two people who knock it out every time. And there's a name for the character in the Phoenix Project. I forget who that person was. Uh, so I can't claim Brent, that as was a... Was it not? Was it a Brent or Brett? Brent? Brent? I think it was Brett. 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 Something like that. You're, okay. you're in the right neighborhood, for sure. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, you're, so you're talking about capturing information around operations and so on. And, and routinize, I just uh, asked Google. And yeah, that's a word to make routine uh, <laughs> is what it means. And uh, exactly as you intended. Yeah. And... That's different from, it's not a prescriptive engineering formula. Thou shalt build VLANs and VRFs as thusly, and therefore shall the first hop gateway be configured. It's not that sort of a framework at all then. Correct. Correct. There might be different things that work in different organizations, right? And again, this is a plus and a minus, right? You can go into most popular network operating systems, and there are more than one way in many cases, to instantiate specific network services. Um, is that a feature or a bug? Uh, it is what it is, right? It's how certain things have evolved. Um, but as long as you have it routinized within your organization, you know, company A and company B don't necessarily need to do it the same way. But within an operating team, having a common understanding of this is how we do it here, that can be very useful, even if there are other ways to do it. And there is a tension here between putting things in a process and thinking about how this all works together in an organizational form and leveraging individual performance. And again, sometimes that cowboy behavior, superstar behavior is what you need, but let's, let's make that the exception and not the rule, right? Uh, stated more positively, man, some places we have great ability to innovate. And how do, we, how do we do this and make things more routine without stifling individual innovation? I don't think that's a, a question to be answered once. I think that's a principle to keep in mind and, and be seeking to find balance on that front. And it, it's got to be more than just document. I documented a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff that no one read. Right. So there's got to be more. A framework like this has to be adopted culturally in order for it to be impactful. Would you agree? Absolutely. I totally agree. Yep. Yeah, I mean, again, the whole cowboy superstar behavior issue is a cultural issue, right? So out of the gate here, we're talking about dealing with cultural issues that require leadership to set tone on. And, you know, you can't just boil it down to training, but making a part of the ethos, making a part of the culture of the organization. Um, th there's another pet, pet one I have right here, too, where... Uh, Again, from the very early days of our, our interwebs experience, you know, remember when you had to put the flame suit on, you're about to ask a question, you know, it was controversial, or you were going to ask a question you really weren't sure, and um, you were afraid of what kind of response you were going to get. Let's, let's get rid of that behavior. That's, if I'm going to call anything toxic behavior, that's toxic behavior, right? Um, if we can create an environment where, Given a, a right minimum level of doing your homework and then asking the question, 
don't don't stomp on anybody for asking the question. They're probably asking it in good faith because they tried and they couldn't find the answer. The the easier we can make that, um, the less hesitant people will be to ask questions, um, and you get to solutions faster, right? I as a tech engineer, I remember we had a support dash private alias. It's like I don't know these escalation engineers. They're gonna tear me a new one. Um, just for asking this question. And that's that's counter to progress. That that doesn't help you as an organization. Scott's opinion. So what are the big steps we need to work through as network operators then if we wanted to adopt TNOPs? I think there are a couple of easy ways to start that align with the two principles. One from that systems thinking approach. Zoom outside your silo and think more about how should the tools interconnect? How should these processes interconnect? Instead of just thinking about, this is what I have to do to get this VRF instantiated. This is what I need to do for this particular ACL or firewall filter, as we called it in other operating systems. You know, zoom out, zoom above. It's as simple as somebody at a conference telling me to rise above and, and read outside your area this is not a hard thing to do for people to start thinking this way. When you when, define silo for us, though, you said think outside your silo. If we think of like network or networking as a silo, do you mean other technical silos? Where are you going? No, all the disciplines within network operations, right? I can get really focused on my automation tooling and live there, uh, okay. right? I can get really focused on, well, this is what it takes, you know, for, uh, for iOS config, and I'm just going to live there, right? I'm going to be so focused on visibility right? And whatever tools I use for visibility or integrations with Zendesk, you know, or working up to service now and so forth. Sorry to drop vendor names, nothing, no, no endorsement intended here on anything, just trying to keep it real. Subject matter expertise is required. I'm not anti-subject matter expertise, <laughs> but, yeah. but think about your outside your lane, right? If you don't change lanes without turning your signal, Right. Let let signal to other people what you're doing and you know how you can collaborate amongst those silos. That makes sense. Yeah. 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 Although I, I was wondering if you meant outside of networking as a broad discipline uh, as well, as I, I think that can have a, a bearing. You're interacting with the software developer who needs to deploy code on infrastructure that relates to networking. Sometimes it's helpful to have that conversation with the developer. Wait, what are you trying to do again? And your networking requirement is what? Uh, and the same thing for virtualization and whatever the other tech silos uh, might be, the cloud folks and, and on and on. That's in scope here. Yeah, that's definitely in scope. And interaction with, with the application teams when it can be had is a really good thing. Um, again, back in my career working for Bell Atlantic, the telephone company, I was an IT network guy. And I couldn't believe how many different user groups were trying to do things to the network without any consideration for um, what's it going to take from a network resource perspective. So I, you know, somebody uh, called me the mayor of Chesapeake. Chesapeake was a, a complex in Maryland that I was the network guy responsible for. And I would go around to the different application groups. It's like, let's just talk. Tell me what you're trying to do so we can understand and or set expectations that, you know, you might not be able to do this right away. <laughs> but if you wait six months for this next upgrade, you'll have better success. Yeah, those conversations are really important. And, you know, back to the looking to almost 100 year old um, manufacturing engineering concepts and how they might be applicable in a network operations organization. I think that's completely in the spirit of what you were just talking about. What about on the evaluating new tech and new tools? Because that's, I think, one of the ways the network engineering discipline gets itself into trouble by chasing the new shiny. Uh, how do you, how does your, how does TNOPs apply to that? Because you said very specific, you called that out very specifically as an area for improvement. So you're right. And when I say evaluation, I, I mean that very precisely. It's not a, well, let's just bring it in and try it or, you know, create all our own shadow IT right away. Um, let's take a look, right? And I and I will grant you a, a lot of this initial discussion for me was motivated 
by the looming presence of AI and AI enabled tooling here. It's like, this is a big, scary thing. And again, it's kind of embedded in the automation discussion where there are people who are concerned that automation might take away their job. Even more so, they're worried about AI taking away their job. Uh Well, let's go and do some discipline analysis of how we might use, you know, certain new tools, whether it's chat GPT or BARD or some of the new AI enabled tools that are coming out there. Um, let's not just wing it, but, you know, design experiments, um, very small scope experiments to see, you know, could something be useful? And by the way, that, that comes straight, straight from Deming as well. Um, in the interest of continual improvement, try small things, um, smaller batch sizes instead of, you know, scaling up for a production run that's going to take two weeks. And so you're not just talking about, let's have a bake off and look at the three top names in this field and see who we like the best. It's you're asking, you're essentially asking folks, why are we doing this? Let's talk about the why before we talk about the which one. So that's definitely part of the conversation, but there's also that, um, operation self-protection that I alluded to earlier in the conversation. You ops teams are going to get technology decisions pushed down on them by yeah. architecture and engineering. Yeah. It, 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 it's unfortunately largely the way that it works. Um, I would love to be able to use this to change some of that a little bit, but there's a, there's a foothold here where operations can take some responsibility to say, well, look from within an operations context, here are tools that I can use to make this better. And the AI tool set, I think, provides great promise there. How do I how do I do data reduction? How do I get over human cognitive limits? Right. All within the operations context that don't depend on higher level, you know, router and switch platform decisions and things like that. I guess along similar lines, how does TNOPS come into an organization? Is it a ground up the, the the people demand it? Is it a top down? A, and I have to be a network engineer or a network designer to bring this into the org. How does that happen? Well, because of the emphasis on looking across silos and tying up to business requirements, I, I think there is a part of this that is unavoidably top down or requires leadership. Uh-huh. I don't think it would, it could be a strictly grassroots effort and not to take anything away from really useful grassroots efforts. This, there needs to be a meet in the middle of some sort on this. Um, and <clears throat> the way this could look is, you know, there might be a first line manager or a second level manager that sees value in this and starts trying certain things within the operations team and advocates for it up towards higher levels of management. And Just like I've talked a lot about in the context of NAF, the importance of building business cases for automation, there should be a business case associated with this too. Again, nobody should just say, we're going to do TNOPs without any real analysis and justification. I may have just shot myself in the foot on this, but uh, that's okay. It's the way it should be. Get in, loser. We're doing TNOPs. Yeah. <laughs> and as as the leading TNOPS consultant, no, uh, maybe, maybe the only so far. So, well, can I, can I adopt it incrementally or is it an all or nothing approach? Great question. So, yes and yes. Are there <laughs> things I can do incrementally? Yeah, not to recycle examples here, but again, you can start thinking about how things are connected, you know, across your ops organization within the broader organization that doesn't cost you anything to start thinking about talking about having lunch, you know, with somebody from uh, another team that you have questions with when you offer to pay for lunch that often helps Um, that costs nothing to get started being more deliberate and evaluating new tech. Most of us love to do that anyway. Right. So there's, there's harnessing that, but saying, okay, what should my objectives be for, implementing this AI tool, this new visibility tool, et cetera. Um, putting just a little more rigor around that. Those are, those are no cost ways to get started. However, I am a big fan of um, begin with the end in mind, you know, from the seven habits. And I think you'll find immediately you're going to need some structure to figure out where the puck is going. So everybody can skate in the same direction. 
apologies to anybody who's not a hockey fan. So you, you can get started, but it's not going to be a random effort or an individual effort for a long time. I think it does need some structure and ways to tie the pieces together. And in terms of cost, it sounds like there's not a cost, like I'm not hiring a consultant, I'm not spending money for this, but there may be cost to my time that I'm putting into this and cost to my reputation on taking a risk with wanting to bring forth uh, a framework or process like this. Yeah, I think you're spot on. The, the initial cost would largely be in, the form, in the, the form of, I have to allocate time for this. And whether that's, you know, a person as an organizational leader and people doing individual things, you know, to, to try and move the ball forward on this. I have thought of the idea of maybe there's a, a role called an operations architect where maybe it's a net new person. Maybe it's an existing person who just wears that hat, who kind of has responsibility for, you know, what's the big picture? How, how is... How are automation, orchestration, visibility, collaboration, and other tools responsible for fitting together? I like that. And all of a sudden, I have an irrational desire to have a job with that title. I want to be an operations architect. It sounds amazing. <laughs> it just made sense, right? When it, when it yeah, came out it really of my does. fingers. You know, I mean, maybe I need an ops architect. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And I'm a big fan of Moneyball, right? You know, the, the movie where... You don't need clones of people who have left. Um, you don't have one profile of this is what the best operations engineer looks like. But I know the skills that I need on the team. And again, this is leadership responsibility and knowing your team and figuring out, okay, you know, how do I bring this skill set in and this skill set in? And by the way, that's not always through hiring. That could be through training and opportunity, opportunity development or Development for professional opportunity. Sorry, I'm just totally, let me try that again. Opportunities for professional development. Um, you don't always have to bring people in just to get new skills on the team. And since, you know, one of the principles here is about tying things uh, back to the business, how would I, if I'm thinking about undergoing this TNOPS journey, tie it back to the business owner to say, here's why it's worth taking the time out of my schedule to pursue this? I think there's a, a a question that that precedes that i think there's a conversation around look we have we have a way that we think we can provide more continuity all the way from services that we want to deliver as a company through specific objectives that tie into what's happening in the network uh, let's let's figure out what that looks like together and there's some you know, it's, it's going to be a different title in different organizations, right? And it might be the VP of engineering or VP of network engineering. It might be a CIO. Um, it might be a CTO. But there are opportunities to collaborate with exec level folks to provide buy-in on this, right? So it's not a, hey, we definitely want to do this this way on day one. Maybe introduce the topic a little more gently and write the TNOPS field guide so you can use it before that conversation starts. I just tasked myself. <laughs> well, maybe the elephant in the room question, Scott, is the one we haven't talked about yet. How does TNOPS help with adoption of network automation? It almost requires it. So here's one way I would think about it. Even just outside of TNOPS, automation is a way to get time back, right? Um, it's not automatic. You got to do it thoughtfully. But if I can routinize specific network functions like the device upgrades, like the pre and post checks and so on and so forth, I should be able to have more cycles to do more of the things I'm calling out in TNOPS here. Again, think more broadly about those connections between the silos and so forth. It's also very much in line with the whole idea of let's turn things into a process so we're not we're not reliant on overly reliant on individuals, right? I'm trying to automate processes in the network. So I don't have to have somebody in every maintenance window hand jamming this config in again and again and again. So I see a lot of really positive alignment there. Which makes sense. Although you say it almost requires network automation, which will sound a little daunting for shops that are wanting to improve their operational workflow, but haven't gotten into automation just yet. But uh, perhaps it's part of a total network transformation. Um. It, you certainly could put it in that context for sure. And I know you, you know, maybe perhaps slightly in jest, but there's truth in what you just said. Yep. 
this guy, so people that are thinking about TNOVs, they think now maybe they're thinking about network automation and then it just hit them. Uh, but I have a multi-vendor network. Does TNOPs help there or is it just harder? No, I, I think it helps. I'm actually really encouraged by what I'm seeing in the product ecosystem today. This comes from, again, from the last year of being really, really focused on automation and having some of the other players engaged um, in NAF and their intentional use of integrations, right? Everybody knows that I'm going to need to work with other products. And uh, the prominence of creating and highlighting integrations between visibility products, service portals for not just automation, but orchestration, um, and other parts of the ecosystem, you know, it's, uh, there's really good work to leverage there. And we can joke and say, you know, integrations are the new API and be snarky about it. But I think there's really something to it. And it, it all comes down to testing, right? You know, you say you've got an integration between product X and product Y. This should be part of your TNAPS process. Well, let's take a look. Does this look useful to us? And then we find a way to see if it's going to actually work in our in our multi-vendor environment. So I'm hopeful on that front. And I think I think it's totally doable. Well, Scott, I love your vision. Total network operations as a framework, uh, uh, a means by which people can think about how they're doing operations and improve network operations. And I, I also like how you're making the point about automation that essentially it requires network automation because automation, it's more than just a convenient script now to automate some routine process you don't want to deal with. It's now a way to deliver network services in a repeatable way that is not error prone and timely and uh, begin to integrate testing and so on. It's it's evolved to be so much more over the last few years. And I it makes total sense to me with what you're trying to do with TNOPS, that network automation is going to become an integral part of that. Another thing you said, Scott, along the way was that uh, you're looking for help in input. And this is going to be a lot of people that offer input into TNOPS to, to make it a thing. How do people interact with you on TNOPS? So I would definitely point people to LinkedIn um, for, you know, that primary point of contact. There's both the NAF, auto, the Network Automation Forum page on LinkedIn, and then me personally, my DMs are open. Feel free to, to drop me a note anytime. We publish stuff at the, the NAF blog, you know, networkautomation.forum slash blog. A lot of it gets cross-posted to LinkedIn anyway, since LinkedIn seems to be where all the cool kids are, um, and it's pretty effective. You know, I'm also working to basically get some real implementation experience with this. And I have a relationship with uh, Cypress Consulting where we're actually using and adapting, you know, TNOPs and building the TNOPs framework as a framework for service delivery. And that's pretty exciting. It keeps it from just being an academic exercise for me. So look for more on that front and uh, please hit me up on LinkedIn. Happy, uh, happy to interact. And I'm, I'm Scott Robon, still on X, Twitter, um, whatever we're calling it today. You know, it's, it's uh, still pretty useful. Well, Scott, thank you for coming on Heavy Networking today to talk about Total Network Operations. And thank you out there for listening to Heavy Networking. I've been Ethan Banks with Drew Conray Murray. And you can find us both on LinkedIn as well. If you're interested in contributing to Scott's efforts with TNOPS, connect with him on LinkedIn, like he said, Scott Raban, and get a conversation started. And by the way, if you're thinking about going to AutoCon 1, get that travel approval and register at networkautomation.forum. As Drew was saying earlier, the inaugural Autocon event, Autocon Zero, that was in December, or November of 2023, that was outstanding. And I am really, I'm very keen to go to Autocon 1 and 2 in 2024. And if you like, you want to see the talks and stuff that they're all up on YouTube, Network Automation Forum has published them all, just do a search, they're there. If you like thought-provoking conversations like this one, please check out the many other podcasts that we publish over at Packet Pushers, all for your professional career development. For you folks that are interested in managing those workloads, we've got Day 2 Cloud and Kubernetes Unpacked. If you're keen on even more networking, there's Packet Protector for the security-minded, IPv6 Buzz for all your V6 adoption needs, and Heavy Wireless for that special access point in your life. And to keep up with the Packet Pushers analysis of everything happening in IT, don't miss Heavy Strategy and Network Break. And of course, we've got new newsletters, blogs, a YouTube channel with courses and more. It's all free, no login required to visit packetpushers.net for everything we offer. Last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.